those skills. Uh, it just be important. Okay, so now we're going to go to our demonstration. And demonstrating today, I'm going to let uh, Ron Dippler, who is the Robonaut Project Manager, uh, do the demonstration. And he'll introduce anyone else that is going to be involved. Aren't you along? One of Robonaut's most important jobs is to be an assistant or a tool for crew. They can do that in a number of fashions. One, one example is it can set up a work session. For, for example, it can move back a thermal blanket and expose a piece of hardware the crew needs to work on. Also, it can stand side by side with the crew person and hand the crew person tools, take back parts, help in the whatever maintenance procedure is going on. But to be able to do that, the robot has to have the range of travel, the workspace, and the speed to be comfortable to work around. So the first demonstration I'm going to show here gives you a sense of robot's, robot's range of motion and a little bit about its dexterity and also a sense for its speed. sibling robot curling on Discovery is heading. <laughs> now just as the space station is serving as a test bed as we develop Robonaut technology, Robonaut itself is a test bed as we explore new technologies for dexterous robots. For example, in the upper joints of the arm here, we actually use springs to sense the forces as the robot either applies to the environment or that the robot feels as it's making contact or when someone comes in contact with it. These springs give us a great deal of flexibility in how we control the robot. It allows us to basically make a virtual spring at the center point of the palm. And what's very important about this, if the robot is removing a device or putting a device back in, it wants to have a certain level of stiffness in one direction and then softness in another direction. So essentially, as I move it, it wants to come back to the same place. It's essentially a virtual spring. And we are able to do that by measuring the forces off these springs. But it's also a step in jointed arm. That gives us the ability to move the elbow while keeping the hand relatively in the same place. That's important for collision avoidance if you're moving around. Also, we can change the stiffness of the elbow. It was soft a moment ago, but we can also stiffen it up so that the robot, just like a human, might want to get leverage off of its elbow as it's performing a test. Finally, ha having that seven degree of freedom, we can, the robot itself can automatically move that elbow around as it's performing a test. Now, to be an astronaut assistant, it's very important that the robot be comfortable to work around. We have spent a great deal of time looking at different ways of measuring forces in the robot. Not only do we measure the forces from the springs in the robot, we also have additional redundant force sensors, both at the shoulder and in the forearm. These sensors give us a second set of measurements that if either one of them were to have a difficulty, we could still know what forces are being applied to the robot. And they're all monitored, and there's a limit at which, beyond a certain force, the robot either pauses or the robot will be turned off. So right now, we're just going to run through a, a sequence. And imagine you're working next to the robot, and you don't know it's about to perform this sequence. The idea is that, just like if you're working next to a person, if there's inadvertent contact, there's going to be a problem. We have a variety of overriding systems that are monitoring those sensors. We also make sure that the force the robot's applying, oh, excuse me, that, the robot doesn't only exerts as much force as it needs to perform the task at hand. So it's very easy for me to overpower the robot because it's really not exerting anything more than it needs to hold position or go through that trajectory. 
it's one of the very important things that makes it comfortable to work around. At any point in time, I can stop it. Or if it bumps me or I bump it, there's no issue. Now, dexterity. Dexterity is key. We're going to be working with the same tools and interfaces and crew or tool. We have to have the dexterity that's similar to a human hand. In Broken Out 1, we started with the pressure, the essential dexterity of what a human has in a pressurized glove. We tried to go even further with Broken Out 2. We were able to do that by, in this case, having a four-jointed thumb. Obviously, thumb is critical for a human's dexterity. The thumb, with this this number of joints and the full range of motion of the fingers gives us the ability to form a wide range of grasps. Dexterous grasps that use our three primary fingers and also tool and power grasps that use our full hand. Now just as we measure the forces in the robot using the springs I showed you earlier, we also drive the robot hands using tendons. The tendons are monitored by different types of force sensors actually within the palm. By measuring those sensors, we can set the stiffness of the fingers also. In my hand right here, I have a thumb. Actually, the thumb has five tendons in it, and that is to control the four degrees of freedom of the thumb, four joints. You only need one more tendon in the number of joints based on the strategy that the last tendon keeps everything else tight. So using those force signals, we can set the stiffness to the finger. And we vary that stiffness depending on whether or not we're holding a object that we want to really stiff grasp on, or we have something very delicate. So we can make it very light, or we can make it so it holds on really tight. It all depends on the task at hand. Now, as panelists mentioned earlier, Robonaut is somewhat different from other humanoid robots. And my colleague and counterpart from General Motors is going to talk about some differentiation between Robonaut and other humanoid robots out there. Hey, Fran. I'm Marty Lynn. I'm the principal engineer of robotics for General Motors. I, on behalf of the rest of the team, we're really excited you guys are here. Thank you very much for your interest in the robot. Um, you know, Ron talked about the various capabilities of the robot. One of the very obvious capabilities of this robot is it has two hands. Two, it has two arms and two hands that allow it to do a variety of different tasks. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to demonstrate the robot's ability to be able to, um, to be able to handle a heavy payload, in this case, 20 pounds. And one of the things, I'm going to ask my uh, lovely assistant, Mr. Adam Parsons. <laughs> Adam, besides being uh, very good looking and uh, young and strong, he also, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not here. <laughs> he also uh, was one of the, the uh, mechanical designers on the team. So, uh, go ahead. We're going to show the robot actually being able to, to manipulate a fairly substantial weight, in this case 20 pounds. This is really the type of payload you have to have to be able to do various tasks. Adam's going to show you him also lifting 20 pounds, and one of the discussions earlier was a comparison between human endurance and robot endurance, uh, and Adam's going to show you the human endurance, and we'll see how he fares against the robot endurance. <laughs> Pretty good so far. He's doing well. You can tell Adam's very fit. <laughs> and normally, these types of motions you would expect uh, uh, a human could also do. Now, Adam has the capability of being able to do more specific weight than the robot, but then actually being able to hold on to the weight and have the endurance to be able to keep it held out in position is considerably different. Pretty good, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we, we pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Adam. 
<laughs> How are you enjoying your stand? <laughs> so, go ahead, and we'll, we'll let Adam off the hook. The robot, of course, doesn't get tired. Adam isn't tired either. <laughs> And you see the robot is able to then put the weight down. Again, this type of manipulation, being able to pick up, thank you, Adam, that's very good. <laughs> this type of, of manipulation, being able to handle a payload of that kind of, of weight range for this class of robot is very, very unique, very different. And again, allows us to be able to have a robot that does, uh, that does real work. Uh, so I was commenting earlier, this robot has two hands, so being able to lift up a, a heavy weight and manipulate that object is, is one thing. Being able to handle a variety of different types of materials, different weights of materials, is, is a completely different class of uh, task. And again, what we did when we designed the robot is we wanted to be able to, to address as many different varieties of tasks, work tasks, as possible. So in this case, we have a, a what's called a space blanket. It's very, uh, it's a floppy, irregular object, and we're going to use two hands in this case to um, be able to manipulate the object. We do have the machine vision working. You can see up on the screen and behind it. The robot's actually lifting the blanket up and clearing it. And look, it found inside it has an envelope. So in this case, without any kind of other programming, uh, we're actually going to go in and we lift the blanket up. Now the robot grabs the, the envelope inside. <clears throat> and then it presents it for us to be able to uh, take. Somebody was asking earlier about uh, the autonomy level. One of the things that we're showing here in the background, and I'm sorry I'm in the way, uh, you can see the, the screen, the green part. The robot's actually looking and waiting for me or someone to come in and pick the envelope up out of his hands. And so I grab the envelope, and the robot senses that, and it then releases the envelope and goes back to its, uh, to its position. Okay? Wow. Again, those are the types of, of range of tasks that the robot is able to do because it has two hands, because it has the dexterity in the hands, and it also has the strength to be able to do real work. Okay, I'm going to talk more. <laughs>